I hope it's streaming. It said it is. <laughs> How can you tell? Church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Community United Methodist Church. It's beautiful fall morning. My name is Murray Murphy. I'll be your lady privileges today. And uh, would you please bow your head with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, the opportunity to come and worship here in this hour, to hear your word, to just love one another in fellowship and harmony at Community United Methodist Church. Dear God, be with us today. Be with our pastor as he delivers our message. And dear God, forgive us for we fail you. We fail you often. And I say this all in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We do have a few announcements this morning. Uh, of course, on the bulletin, if you have the life of the church this week at the CUMC. I'm not going to go into that specifically, but uh, we have a lot going on here. And announcements, uh, All Saints book deadline is Tuesday, October 29th, so that's a couple of days from now. And secondly, uh, devotionals for our Advent, Advent booklet, and he shall be called or do Sunday, November the 10th. I do have a couple of other announcements here. Uh, Dana, uh, Scouts are selling wreaths. Christmas related, of course. And if you are interested, see Sam. Sam, stand up. I hear you. Yeah, see Sam. Or Dana. Or Matt. Or Who? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Good. Anyway, if you need a wreath, see these people. Uh, also, Dustin, as you know, is planning to have a trip to Israel about this time next year. And if you're interested, and certainly encourage this, if you're interested, he's going to have a brief meeting after the service today, I guess, right here, here in the sanctuary. So that's a trip to Israel about a year from now. So if there are no other announcements, no other announcements, we will do our call to worship. I know, I'll tell you what, we're going to stop. Stand up. <laughs> no, no, y'all don't stand. Last week I got kind of bossy with y'all. Andy, would you come up here? Testimony. So, Anna has been on the staff for seven years and. <laughs> I'm kicking her to the curb. <laughs> her personal financial business is going so well. Um, earlier this year, she stepped down from five days a week to three days a week for us. Um, and Diane, uh, Diana, where are you at? Diana, back here. There, um, stepped in on Wednesdays and Fridays. And Anna feels like her business is in such a place now that she's going to go um, mostly full time. She's still going to do our personal church finances for us. She does my personal finances too, as well. Um, <laughs> But Diana will be in the office five days a week, and this week is Anna's last week. So, thank you for service to the church, to me, to our um, SPRC. We have been well accepted her resignation. We've been putting it off. Go to the microphone. I know that the first SPRC meeting that I went to when I first got here, before I even started, they told me, and Anna's going to retire or resign. Um, I, you can't retire again, right? <laughs> She's going to resign at the, in the three to five months, probably. And I convinced her to stay on longer. And we're thankful for all of your service. We have a basket full of cards and goodies for you in the back. And Thursday will be her last day in the office. And if she's not there at 11 and the office is closed down, it's because we're doing something different, okay? So just FYI, uh, 
that Thursday will be her last day in the office. Can we pray over you? Father, I thank you so much for Anna, her life in you, and her life in this church. I thank you for all the years of service that she has given to us. And I pray that you be with her business because I know that it's scary for her to step out on her own. I pray that you would continue to allow it to increase. Allow her faith and her journey in you to deepen as well. So we just thank you. We pray that you continue to pour out your blessing upon her and the girls and her family. And just allow them to know how great they are and how loved they are by us at Community Methodist Church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Anna. And Diana will be our secretary starting November 1. Now the congregation may stand. As we do our call to worship, please follow along in the book on 806 or the screen. Lord, you showed us favor to your hand land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O oh God, of your salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. You will be angry with us forever. Or will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not respite us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. We have a, an old hymn today that's not in our regular hymnal. It's out of the Coast Ferry hymnal. It's called We Praise the Lord God. The words will be on the screen. that you would just continue to pour out your spirit upon us gathered here. 
And as we offer up these gifts and sacrifices to you, I pray that you'd allow us, your church, to use them to glorify your name and expand your kingdom. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And today, one of the things we're trying to, or we do here, is talk about the various missions and ministries that we have going on in our church. And so I'm going to invite Julie Lucas to come up and talk about Faith Community Health Ministry. So if you would, please help me welcome Julie. was started by a pastor in Illinois in 1979. He saw a need for not only the physical body to be cared for, but the total body to include spiritual, mental, and physical. Thus, Parish Health was born, which has grown to become an international organization with certified nurses coordinating the ministry in churches worldwide. This month, we have been blessed in this church to have a community health ministry in this church for 19 years. Our mission states that we are here to minister the love of God to the communities of Rio Doso, Rio Doso Downs, and the surrounding area through health promotion, education, and health care. We get referrals through our church, from surrounding churches, neighbors, even the postmistress um, asked us to go see a person. We serve those who are hurting physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Our services include health education luncheons, CPR classes, an automatic defibrillator for this building and for our fellowship hall and the imagination station. Um, visitation and calls are available weekly to homebound clients, nursing homes, and the hospital. The past year, we have sent just over 250 cards, 340 ribbon crosses, 13 prayer shawls, and 11 pocket prayer pads to our clients. We provided 15 adult, 15 adult, child blankets, and 15 health kits for the nest. We went Christmas caroling and took 31 stuffed animals and cookies to Muscalero Care Center. We took cookies to Good Life and to our shut-ins. And we have Bio for Life folders that you can put on your refrigerator so that EMS knows your emergency contact information if they're called to your house. We provided medical equipment loaner closet for our church and first aid kits in the worship house, the fellowship hall, the library, and the imagination station. If you have ideas for education luncheons, we would love to hear them, and we would love to increase our attendance at our education programs. Faith Community meets Thursdays in the library. I have office hours from 9 to 12. Our volunteers meet at 1 o'clock for a short meeting, a devotion, prayer. We call our clients, and if they choose, we go and visit. Come talk to me if you're interested in our ministry. I would love to thank Dustin for the support that he has given our ministry. <laughs> We're going to have refreshments at the end of the service, so it's not going to be kind of not exactly what we planned. So I understand we're going to go across the street yes. and sing the last song. But I have a question for you. Your faith community health ministry, and you're giving us what for refreshments? We're having cream puffs and German chocolate. <laughs> Shouldn't it be like celery and carrots? <laughs> we make wonderful desserts with this food, right? So I'm kind of thinking about how to coordinate this. We're thinking we have our trays already, so we thought our volunteers will just pick the trays up, and as we go out, 
for the groundbreaking and the last song over there, and they will be passing out. Don't so please get them. I don't want to take them home because Curtis will have to eat them. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. And can I pray with you before we all head down? Um, and this is the reason that we give is we have so many different ministries and missions in our church that we support. I mean, these ladies do an amazing job of pastoral care and ministry. So let us pray. Hey, Father, I thank you so much for these women that you have called out to serve you through Faith Community Health Ministry. I pray that you continue to give them the wisdom and patience as they go visit people and walk through life with them. Allow them to be your hands and feet. Allow people to see Jesus shining through them because of their faithful service to you. Just continue to bless this ministry. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. If you would please rise for the doxology. So, Father, I ask that you would be our vision this morning. That you would help us to keep our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our actions focused and primarily, first and foremost, upon you and your risen Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you would allow us to feel the power and presence of your Holy Spirit in this place, and that you would just overflow within us. That we would leave this place full of your glory, full of your love, and full of your peace. 
But God, so many of us come to this place this morning um, tired and weary from the ways of the world. And so we pray that you would take those things away from us and instead instill in us a peace that surpasses all understanding. So Father, be with these things that we name to you at this time. Lord, hear our prayer. So, Father, be with each and every situation and person that was lifted up. Allow them to know of your grace and mercy at this moment. And we ask all of these things, praying the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses.
inquire. <clears throat> At this time, we can dismiss our children if they would uh, step out to the back and we can dismiss them to the children's church at this time. <laughs> Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town, a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And then on uh, continuing 39 through 42, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. To when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And you may be seated. And if you would, once again, join me in prayer. Father, I pray that you fill us, your children, with your spirit that you would open our ears and soften your, our hearts. And I ask that you allow the words on my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing and acceptable to you, my Lord and my Redeemer. Amen? Amen. Well, today's a good day, right? Yeah. Um, we are going to break ground on a new sanctuary today. Praise be to God. And I do want to ask 
for your forgiveness because it was a little last minute, but I didn't want to celebrate like a groundbreaking service and then have a lot sit empty for two months and nothing happened, right? And I realize I've been here for 16 months now. This is actually the end of my 16th month. And sometimes in Rodoso, people say they're going to do something, and it doesn't mean they're going to do it today or tomorrow <laughs> or even next week. That's true. Yeah. So what I've been told is we will, they are going to, we have lines marked, gutters ready to be trenched out, all that fun stuff, possibly this week. But, you know, they told me this week, so who knows? It may be next week or the week after. Um, but man, it is a day of celebration, um, and I want to say thank y'all for an amazing October. Y'all have loved on me and my family more than we can say thanks for, um, and given me some amazing things, including some, you know, celebratory socks. <laughs> it is a time for us to celebrate. One of the things that I've said over and over since I've been here is we have told, Ashley and I have made the commitment to the church and to the conference that we want to be here longer than three or four years. Yay. Now, there's lots of play in that, but we don't want this to be a stepping stone church for us. You know, typically young pastors go to churches and then stuff happens, and if it's good stuff, they quickly get bumped up. We don't want to be bumped up um, where else in the world can I wake up and come to church and see deer and elk and the fall colors changing and the sun beaming through the trees? You sure can't see that stuff in Lubbock, Texas. So. <laughs> but we are so grateful to be here. But asking um, this question, thinking to myself, if we're here in 10 years, this is 2019, so if we're here in 2029, I started asking myself, what does our church look like in 2029? And take a look around for a second. Do we... Is it scary? Or hopeful? Or a little bit of both? You know? And so I've started praying. It's changed the way I've been praying for the church, because yes, I pray for the church, and Lord willing, I hope you do too, about, okay, God, if we're going to be here in 10 years, what does that look like for us? And I've asked, since I've been here, the leadership, where are we going, how are we going to get there? I mean, Brent has been amazing for me to work with this year, and I've asked our leaders, um, what is our vision, and specifically, where do we want to be at in 10 years? And this comes straight from our ad council meetings, um, straight from our leadership. This isn't something that I concocted in my office one day when I was praying, right? Or um, Googling it on the internet. Where do churches need to be in 10 years? This is not from Google or even my personal prayer time. This is from our leadership. And I want to talk about it for the next month because God is calling us to something into the future. And I want us to move that direction, all right? All right. Okay. I just want to make sure you're still with me there. So, you got your Bible? Or your phone? I'm going to go back with me to John chapter 4. And if you're paying attention this morning, like, what in the world does a woman at a well have to do with the future of the church? Well, I'm going to tell you. So, John chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. I don't want to read it all again, because we have lots going on today, but man... Um, Jesus, it's about Jesus because it's the Gospels, right? So Jesus is in the story, and Jesus is traveling with his disciples. And the interesting note here is Jesus and his disciples, it says they went through Samaria. Now, a good Orthodox Jew would not actually travel through Samaria because the Samaritans were half-breeds. The Jewish people, the Israelites, in the Old Testament, they were commanded to only marry other Israelites. If they married people that worshipped foreign gods, that was a huge no-no. In fact, there's uh, several books that are dedicated to people doing that and the bad stuff that happens to them. And the Samaritans were the people that did that. So good Orthodox Jews, they actually had a path in ancient Israel that would go around Samaria so they did not have to go into Israel or into Samaria. And Jesus, he chose us to go the shorter path through Samaria. And, um, man, I love verse 6, because it tells us about Jesus' humanity. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, weary as he was from his journey, 
Have any of y'all ever been wearied before? I mean, I get wearied, and I'm not Jesus, so I can't imagine. Like, people call me sometimes at strange times and strange places with strange requests, and sometimes it just wears on you, right? And sometimes you just get tired, and some of you um, travel quite a bit, and sometimes you just get tired from your travels. And so here Jesus is, he's been traveling, he's been ministering to the people, he's been doing what the Father has asked him to do, and he's just tired. And he chooses to rest at the most peculiar place to me, at a well. Now, in the ancient Roman society, they did not have bathrooms like we do today. You couldn't go to the water closet, poke it, and get fresh water at any given time. Now, they did have some pretty fancy bathhouses, but I don't want to get too nerdy on y'all. But man, they were pretty crazy for 2,000 years ago. So Jesus goes to the well, which is the main source of water for this village. Now, when Ashley and I were in Africa, what would happen is the women of the village, they would take their jugs of water. They would walk anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to get to the well. They would fill their jug. They would walk another hour back home. Then they would have to boil the water because it was dirty. So they would spend all half of their morning um, walking to a well, getting water, and going back home. And this was the life of the ancient people, is they would go to their source of water and go back home. And Jesus doesn't cho choose to rest at like a rest stop on the side of the path. He chooses like a common place to rest. And as he's resting, a woman, um, and societies have changed, praise be to Jesus. Um, men were here, women were not. Um, Jews were here, Samaritans were not. And so we have Jesus resting, and this woman, this Samaritan woman, comes up. And Jesus does something almost unthinkable for his day. He talks to her. And not only does he talk to her, he actually has the longest recorded conversation that we have of Jesus in any of the Gospels. To this woman, to this Samaritan woman. And not only is she a Samaritan woman, but she has been around. She's one of those people, if you know what I mean. Like, people see her and they're like, look at that sinner, we're glad we're not like her. And if she comes to the well in the sixth hour, not the typical time that most people would come to the well. Most people would do it early in the morning. She does it midday. She's isolated from community. She's all alone. And Jesus says, hey, can you get me a drink of water? life-changing, isn't it? Y'all are like, wow, no. Y'all are like, what? <laughs> you know what Jesus is doing? Is Jesus is giving her a sense of belonging and a sense of community. He's taken a woman that was on the fringes of society and says, I don't care who you are, you are worthy of community. You are worthy of conversation. For us to be a church that moves into the community, we have to be a church that is for community. We have to be a church that builds community internally as well as externally. This means that when you come here, Lord willing, somebody besides me knows your name. Right? We're like, cheers. Maybe not everybody knows your name, but somebody knows your name. Without the beer. <coughs> Which may or may not work. Or it may or may not make my sermons better. But... <laughs> a place where you feel no matter what has happened in your life or what has gone on that you can feel welcomed and loved and embraced where you have men and women that can surround you that can walk through life with you because we serve a God who is a triune God that means Father, Son, and Spirit perfect in nature, perfect in community the very first thing in the Bible that God says is not good is not the first sin, but is that man was alone. Because God created us in his image, which means we were made for community. We were made to live with one another. And that's what we need to do as a church, is to live our lives together. Now this doesn't mean you have to go sell your houses and move all into the church, right? Y'all are like, praise God. <laughs> He's not a communist. <laughs> what it does mean is that we need to be connected to each other. 
whether it's through a Sunday school class or a small group serving on a mission together. We have a team that's in Guatemala actually digging the water well for people today. Praise be to Jesus. Getting to know people and do life with them. And realizing that we don't care if they're a Samaritan. That we don't care if they've been around. And they live that sort of lifestyle. Or even worse, if they're still living that sort of lifestyle. That we love them and embrace and welcome them because love, God loved us and God embraced us and God welcomed us and we didn't earn it or we didn't deserve it. And that's who God is calling us to be. Is God is calling us to be a church of poor community. We are to be a church for building community, because I've said it before, and I'll say it again, if we cannot love and welcome the people that are sitting next to you, how can we ever love and welcome people that are those people? Jesus, simply by having a conversation with this woman, transformed her life. And we're going to delve into it later, because this is one of my favorite pieces of scripture throughout the rest of the month, but I want to skip to the end of it right now, because if you ever do that, sometimes you read the end of the book before you read the middle of it to make sure it ends well. I don't either. The story ends this way. While many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, he told me all that I ever did. Now think about that. You're just on your way to get some water one day, and this stranger's there, and he starts spouting off all the sins you've ever done in your life. That is not a happy-go-lucky feeling, is it? And she goes back home, and she says, Guess what? I came into this contact with this man, and he knew who I was, and he started telling me all the bad stuff I'd ever done, and he still wanted to hang out with me. And he offered me the living water, life eternal. He offered me the resurrection and the hope of Jesus Christ. He told me that I can worship him. And she was dumbfounded. And she went back to her community and she started telling people about who Jesus was. And they started believing him. And then not only that, it says in verse 40, So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. Jesus could have easily bypassed Galilee, or Samaria to go to Galilee. Jesus could have easily, in his tiredness, ignored a woman who he probably shouldn't have been talking to. Because what would y'all do if I was talking to a woman like that in public? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I know Ashley would have something to say about it. And this lady leaves and goes to her house and says, you have to meet this guy. And Jesus gives his time and his effort, and he goes to the community so that they can experience the good news of who Jesus Christ is. So that they can experience his love and his forgiveness, his embrace, his welcome. Yesterday I was at a meeting, and the state of the American Methodist Church is brim at best. Our bishop was there, and he was talking about uh, the decline of American Methodism, and he was talking about going to Africa and the Philippines and even in the secularized Europe and said that the United Methodist Church is actually growing in those places. And one of the people asked, what do those places have in common? What can we do those places are doing? And he said, quite simple, preach the gospel. He said, in all those places, Jesus is proclaimed as Lord and Savior. Preach the gospel and people will come to Christ because that's what Christ has been doing and that's what Christ has done. That's what Christ does here is Christ comes to us. In fact, some of the last words of Jesus that we find in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus told us to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Going to Jerusalem means that we need to be a church for the community. It means that we need to start at home. First and foremost, there are people here that live without hope, that live without love, that live without joy, and some people that just live decent lives. 
And man, I don't know about you, but I say over and over again, Jesus has made my life so much better. And what can he do for those that don't yet know him? We are called to be co-workers of Christ Jesus, going to the community, being a church for the community. Because we no longer live in a field of dreams society. Y'all remember the movie Field of Dreams, right? Kevin Costner, 80s, maybe early 90s. He has a voice in his head that tells him to build a baseball field in the middle of a cornfield. In the middle of nowhere. And the voice tells him, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. And honestly, 60 years ago in American Christianity, that was the true statement. If you build it, they will come. If we build a new sanctuary across the street, well, people will come. We no longer live in a filled of dreams society. Um, ooh, I forgot my history book from the church on my desk. So you'll have to take my word for it. I was going to read directly from it. Um, you know the history book that tells the history of the church? In 1946, the church was formed. Um, in 1947, our sanctuary was finished. When Reverend Thomas Barkus completed the, when the sanctuary was completed in 1947, um, Reverend Thomas Barkus was interviewed, and he wrote down the reason that this church is named Community United Methodist Church is because this church was built with the help of the entire community. This isn't 1947. The entire community, they're not here today. A few more will show up when we do our groundbreaking. They don't care that we're building a building. <laughs> what they care about is that if there are people that are willing to come to them, to love them where they are, to accept them where they are, to show them who Jesus Christ is, and to offer them a life that is better than they have now, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit makes our lives more full of love and joy and peace. We need to be a church for the community because they need Jesus Christ and I need Jesus Christ as well. And today we are going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate that we're building a new sanctuary because this is an exciting time in the life of our church. And we're going to build it by God, right? Whether they come or not. Yeah. Yeah. And we are going to pray that they come and that there's the paint on the ground and stuff's going to happen. And this is where you know so it may, like I said, be a couple of weeks until it happens. I'll believe it when I see it. Um, <laughs> call me a skeptic. <laughs> but while we may not have the support of the entire community like Reverend Marcus did 72 years ago, we can be a faithful church living into God's future by being a church for the community by going to them in the midst of whatever livelihood they're living and showing them the good news of who Jesus Christ is. Because he longs for us to have a life full of his love and of joy and peace. So with the help of God, we will be a church where community happens and we will be a church for the community. And this is where we are moving into in the future. So Jesus, help us. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, I thank you that you sent your son into this world to live and die for us. I thank you that your son took time out of his life, even though he was tired, to hang with a woman of ill repute. To offer him her, himself. So that she could know of your love and forgiveness. And I pray that you help us to build that sort of community here. Where we have people that no matter what goes on in our lives. Or no matter how far we've gotten off your beaten path. That we would be loved and welcomed and accepted. And I pray that as we live in the midst of a changing world. People no longer long to come to church. That you would help us to be a church that goes to them. A church that transforms this community. Because we long to be a church for the community. So help us, we pray. Lead us and guide us under your way. Amen? Amen. Amen.